You're listening to the Telltale Channel. If you like what I do and you want to see me continue to do it, don't forget to check out my Patreon. You can find some ad-free, uncensored, complete versions of my videos on my website, owenmorgan.com. All links are in the description. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm just now realizing that I can hear an echo in my ear, and it's really hard. Okay, there we go. Fixed it. I just want to make sure I can still hear my sound effects. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. Facebook just makes people think I'm smart. I can still hear it. I, can you guys hear the, the sound effects? I've lived for the Lord my whole life, and I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it. I just want to make sure that the, uh, that the sound effects are audible. COVID-19! COVID-19! I blow the wind of God, the wind of God. on you. That's audible, isn't it? Is this one audible? I can't stop this one. I can't stop this one and I can turn it down. I can't stop it till it's over. Um, anyway, I got, I got a soundboard I'm just messing with now, okay? Everywhere I go, every store, you buy a globe. There's globes everywhere. Every movie, every TV show, news media. Why? <laughs> oh, I love it to death. Strike and 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 strike. Love everything about it. Anyway, all right. So let's get down to business. There's a reason that we're all here gathered together to talk. I wanted to... Uh, draw your attention to something kind of interesting. Eric Wander, one of my members, suggested this video to me, or this, uh, this pastor anyway. Just to see what he's all about, I want to kind of check him out. That's all. See what he has to say, see who he is, what he believes. As far as I know, he is a complete nutcase, and it is nothing but entertaining to sit here and watch him eat himself alive with insanity. So let's uh, <laughs> let's give this a watch. Let's give it a watch and see what this guy has to say, shall we? We we'll start about three minutes in. Oh, by the way, while we listen to him, we're gonna play some uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I'm just fighting battles and stuff, so no spoilers or anything. In the Philippines, we got the uh, Lamongo family, and they're watching all three of them. And they participating in our Revelation Now series. So if you have a picture of your family group or maybe if you're part of um, a group that's meeting, maybe in a church, uh, send us a picture. You can upload the picture at revelationnow.com. Tonight's topic Revelation Now is entitled The Devil's Dungeon. And we have a lesson that goes along with the topic. It's uh, one of our landmarks of prophecy studies. It's entitled The Devil's Dungeon, and this is... He keeps saying entitled The Devil's Dungeon. It's it is called, it's titled The Devil's Dungeon. You are entitled to your rights. You are entitled to free speech. A book is titled this or that, or a movie is titled... Blah. Why does he keep saying entitled? Okay, little thing. Not going to get hung up on the little stuff is available to you for free you can download the lesson at the uh, I, yeah and by the way i'll pass thank you for your recommendation for your stupid garbage okay now we're getting into the talk looking at a fascinating study we talking pastor doug about that 1000 year period that we read about in revelation chapter 20 yes and very important to understand dude what's playing Is something playing right? Did something play just now? Do you guys hear that? I don't know what the hell that was. Something played in my ear just now. Whatever. Okay, now we're going to listen to Pastor Doug, apparently. Looks like a trustworthy guy. You can see it in his face, right? Look at that gorgeous mustache. Just one of a kind. Top tier mustache right there. That's a mustache you can trust. That is a mustache that absolutely does not scream pedophile. Doesn't scream it at all. 
So, okay, let's listen to what Pastor Doug has to say with his uh, beautiful mustache. We always do. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you once again that we're able to be here and thank you for health and strength and the opportunity to gather together and open up your word. And so we ask your special blessing as we delve into the last book of the Bible and we look at a very important passage in Revelation. Oh my God, they're talking about the book of Revelation. I love talking about the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. You guys have no idea how much research I did for those two books specifically when I was researching for my book because Jehovah's Witnesses base so much of their Bible prophecy garbage on Daniel and Revelation, and they have no idea what they're about, no clue. So I had to, like, just basically I read the book start to finish and studied each individual chapter of the book of Daniel and try to figure out what the scholarly consensus was for each individual section. So I... And, you know, I'm not an expert on this stuff. An expert would be able to speak like ancient Hebrew. But I'm about as close as it gets as a layman. Dude, I know this stuff like the back of my hand. So, okay. Let's hear what he has to say about Revelation and uh, Daniel. Revelation 20. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And once again, Pastor Ross will be joining me again immediately after our study and our presentation and we'll be answering your Bible questions. So we'd encourage you, if you have Bible questions on the subject tonight, then you can Facebook, send them on in to us, and we'll be delving with them. You can Facebook, send them in, okay? Uh, in our time after the program. Well, we're going to be studying today the theme of the Devil's Dungeon, which is based on Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to be basically covering that whole chapter that talks about some of the last day events dealing with the millennium. But we were very interested to kind of get out on the streets and ask the average Americans, what do you think or what do you know about the millennium? Oh, no. Did they do, did they do like street witnessing stuff? Did they go around and ask people like, um, like Ray Comfort style what they thought about these religious topics? Okay, go on. So here's some of the responses that we received. When I think about when I hear about the millennium. They did, they did. They, they hit the streets, oh boy. Millennium is all of the many times throughout my long life where people have thought that the millennium was coming. And they were- What the hell do they mean by the millennium? Yeah, the millennium passed like 25 years ago, okay? I don't, what do you mean the millennium is coming? What the hell does that mean? Wrong. Satan would be bound into the bottom pit for 1,000 years. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, so in the, uh, you know, if you're not a Christian, you've never been affiliated with it or whatever, um, if you're unfamiliar with this whole thing, there's like this Christian story about the millennium where... God is going to, like, bound Satan up in... Or no, he's going to release Satan. That's what it is. He's going to release Satan into the world for a thousand years pretty soon. If, and it's going to be for, like, a thousand years, and he's going to have a chance to, I don't know, um, like, try to turn us or whatever other thing. I, who knows? Uh, these people, I, I like, they seem to have their own, like, weird theology about this subject. I don't fully understand, like, what they, you know, how they view it, basically. Uh, they call it millennial. It'll be peace on earth. The, the sheep will lay with the lamb. And there will be a lot of peace. Did he say sheeple will lay with the lamb? Okay. Peace. But after he's let out of the ball in the pit, like I referred to earlier, then he's going to cause havoc again upon mankind and upon this earth. I believe that we uh, who have a relationship with Jesus will uh, be raptured. In other words, we'll be taken up with him. Um, and then after a thousand year reign, a millennium, then he will come back. What's the most? Dude, it, this is called eschatology. If you never heard the term, it means end times belief. Now, I don't know what these people's specific end times beliefs are. Like, um, I don't know if they think that you know, like Jehovah's Witnesses, like the end is 
right around the corner is going to be here any five minutes now or I, I like i don't know i don't know um i would love to know exactly what their end times beliefs are that'd be super fascinating to find out important is humanity like how we treat each other and what we're doing to to be better people not just to ourselves but to others around us i mean i, I don't know any more than that well in accordance to the book of revelations they said the thousand years is when shaitan or satan is going to be released to the earth did he say shaitan i th isn't that the muslim version of satan no, I'm not sure, but I think that last gentleman was videotaping our cameraman as they were videotaping him so he could share the interview with his friends. A lot of different perspective, different uh, comments about the millennium. We're going to find out what the Word of God has to say. And before we... I bet, totally, yeah. We're going to find out what the Word of God has to say, absolutely. Even delve into the lesson, I'd like to just set the background by opening our Bibles together. Go to Revelation chapter 20. And I won't read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read the first segment of this. Revelation 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. All right, let me tell you something about... God, this is like a really hard challenge. I'm like... It's it, it's labeled easy, but it's really hard to do because I keep killing things too quickly. Anyway, let me tell you something about the book of Revelation, okay? It's written in the apocalyptic genre of writing. It's a genre of writing that doesn't exist today, but it's a type of genre that existed at the time that was very much like um it was like sci-fi or fantasy that kind of thing right and it always followed a similar pattern here's the pattern that um that apocalyptic writing followed somebody would see some crazy shit like some angel doing something absolutely nuts uh, you know standing by a river holding a sword or something like that and then, you know, they wouldn't understand it. And an angel would come along from God to explain it to him. And the explanation would somehow involve the Jews being vindicated or saved or they, you know, defeat their enemies or whatever. That was the apocalyptic genre writing. And again, it existed outside the Bible. It was not just a biblical thing. So anyway, um, hang on, let's see. Okay, so he's weak to magic here. So anyway, the point that I'm so laboriously getting to here is the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel were both written in the, uh, the apocalyptic genre of, of writing. They were written in the apocalyptic genre, which means... It doesn't actually literally mean what it says, like in a literal sense. It has a specific meaning to that day and time. The book of Revelation was written in such a way that it, you know, uh, where the, the Jews came out on top. The Jews won at the end of the day. Really, it was the Christians by this point because they had taken over. So the Christians took over. And they were the victors by the end of this. The Christians, John of Patmos was taking over and, and he was going to, you know, God was going to, uh, what's the word? God was going to um, vindicate them and all this other junk. Now, you, you know, you find like weird little code in here that you don't fully understand. Like the number of the beast is 666. In another translation... It says the number of the beast is 616, another manuscript that we found. The number of the beast is actually a gematria, an old puzzle that was done by Jewish people, like, you know, thousands of years ago. It's an old puzzle where you take, you know, you add up numbers, you correspond numbers to letters, you add them up, and you get a final value. Um, 
the number 666, the gamatria for 666 is Neron, which is Emperor Neron. The gamatria for 616 is Nero. Neron was his proper name. That was like his full name. So it seems like plain as day that very obviously this book of Revelation was about how they were being like terribly mistreated by the people around and they were going to be vindicated. Just you wait and see all that other junk. The book of Revelation was not confusing to the people of the day or the, you know, or the area. It was not confusing to them. They understood it perfectly well. It's confusing to you and me and this guy right here because this guy wasn't around at the time. He didn't understand. He doesn't get the, the cultural context. He doesn't get the societal context that is necessary to go along with all of this stuff. That's why he's reading into it and he thinks there's some special meaning and all this other junk. All this stuff he's talking about, you know, he's reading from the book of Revelation, he's completely speaking out his ass. He's just making things up right off the top of his head. He's created an entire theology around garbage. The book of Revelation was not supposed to prophesy the end of the world 2,000 years after Jesus died or whatever. It was supposed to address problems people were having at that time in that place. These people are shameless, dude. He must know that, right? Of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, until the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the soul... Again, like, all of this stuff is metaphorical language that all ultimately pointed to the death of Nero and the vindication of the Christian church. That was the whole idea behind the book of Revelation. And the book of Daniel was written in the year 164 BCE, give or take. It was about Jews' vindication. It was about Jews winning some war against their enemy. At that time, their enemy happened to be um, um, Antiochus Epiphanes IV. That's who their enemy was at the time. So anyway, yeah, like these people have just like made something out of like absolutely nothing. And it is so interesting to watch, honestly. It's ridiculous. ...of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or their hands. And they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And that's the first section. We're going to be covering all of that. And uh, hopefully we're going to take... Yeah, again, like he says, I'm going to be covering all of that, so on and so forth. He has no idea what he's talking about. He doesn't even know what the book meant when it was being written. He has no clue. But okay, let's hear what he has to say here. What to some people think is a difficult subject and, and simplify it. Now, the Bible stories are the key to understanding Bible theology. The Bible stories are there as the key to understanding some of these complex prophetic issues. They aren't complex prophetic issues, okay? The book was about... Nero persecuting Christians at the time. Simple as that. Um, hang on. I'm just checking what this says here. Uh, okay. New tests and trials of the combat simulator. Test at your own peril. Oh, I, compete I completed the quest. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, now I guess if I want, I can... Um... Yeah, okay, cool. 
now I can do like uh, some combat trials. Nice. All right. Revelation, once again, is a kaleidoscope that is pieced together. No, no, it's not. Revelation was a letter written by John of Patmos, more than likely. Not the same John that wrote, not the same John who was purported to have written the book of John. And he just was, he was just writing about how Christians were like mistreated. That's it. And by, by Nero and how they would be vindicated. It was apocalyptic literature. It, it doesn't get more complicated than that. That's it. But okay. From a lot of other Bible stories. We're going to go back to the beginning. And I want you to just know that in the Garden of Eden, when God first made paradise, everything was good, good, very good. The ground was so lush and vibrant and fertile, it produced... Oh, so much to say, okay. It's just so many exotic fruits that we can't even imagine. And man had to do very little in the way of work. He did work, but it was very pleasant. It wasn't grueling. But then after sin and man was evicted from the Garden of Eden, God said, and you read this in Genesis 3:17, cursed is the ground for thy sake. So something happened. Okay, I, I've gone through all of these books and, and I've done this research because I wrote a book recently about um, Jehovah's Witnesses and their eschatology primarily. I wanted to understand, I wanted to know if what Jehovah's Witnesses believed was correct or not. You know, I want to give them, I want to give them a fair shake. Are they right? And the answer is no. No, they're not right. They're wrong, like very wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses are, like about everything. So anyway, um, I did all of this research for the book that I wrote, Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses, and A Hundred Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses. Two different books. Uh, owenmorgan.com slash book can be found in the, in the description, by the way. And I addressed all of this in the book. Um, the book of Genesis, now I don't know how we jumped from Revelation to Genesis in this weird video that we're watching here, but okay. The book of Genesis is written as a historical narrative but it's something called, um, oh, what's it called? It's um, antiquity literature. That's what it is. It's antiquity literature or archaeology literature. And though it is um, historical narrative, when it was written... They, div they didn't differentiate between fact, myth, and legend. They just smushed it all together, basically. It's like it's campfire stories that they all, you know, combined together and, you know, added up and all that other junk. I mean, here's an example. Uh, a lot of people probably heard this story. Just bear with me for a second, Okay. There's a scorpion and there's a frog and the scorpion wants to cross the river and the scorpion asks the frog, he says, hey, um, can you take me across the river? And the scorpion says, no, I'm not taking you across the river. If I take you across the river, you're going to sting me and we're both going to die. And the scorpion says, no, 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 I swear, I'm not going to do that. I promise I'm not going to sting you. I would die too. Why would I do that? And the frog reluctantly says, okay, fine, I'll take you, let's go. He hops on his back, they cross the river, they're halfway through, and wouldn't you know it, the scorpion stings the frog. As the frog goes down into the river, he says, why did you do that? Now we're both going to die. And he says, because I'm a scorpion, and that's what scorpions do. Now what does that mean exactly? Is there some deeper meaning to that? Is there something special about that? It has talking animals, and it has fantastical stories, and all this other stuff. Is there something, like, special that we should be gleaning from this or whatever? The answer ultimately is no. It's a campfire story. The special thing we should be gleaning from it is, like, right on the surface. Bad people do bad things sometimes. Just, like... If you know somebody's a bad person, don't trust them because they're going to screw you over. 
But people like this guy right here seem to have taken like these campfire stories written in the book of Genesis about Adam and Eve and everything else and Noah and all that and turned it into like literal stories that they literally believe like this fr then this frog literally was talking to this scorpion and this real scorpion said to this real literal frog if you just take me across the river it's a joke dude it's a it's a campfire story it's never meant to be literal it's an embarrassment you know what the word adam means adam it means soil that should be your first sign that it's supposed to be um metaphorical the fact that the guy's name is literally soil but okay okay whatever you know what let's just hear him out happened the earth wasn't going to be quite as vibrant and productive then you get to genesis chapter 4 and well god told adam in genesis 3 19 in the sweat of your face you will eat bread then you go to Genesis 4, and after Cain killed his brother, the curse was even furthered for Cain. Who did Cain have children with, by the way? I know that this is like a common question everybody always asks because it's, it's so obvious. Like, <laughs> there's no good answer to it. Who did Cain have children with to reproduce, to create, to perpetuate the human race? It was his sister, right? It must have been his sister. There's no other explanation here. But how did it, like, not, like, kill him or whatever? How did it not, like, create serious deformities with, you know, genetic, uh, because it's genetically close? How did that not happen? I mean, I guess you can fill God in anywhere you want and say, oh, well, God made it so that didn't happen, so. Well, I can fill God in anywhere. I can claim God did whatever, that doesn't make it true. Uh, once again, this is like a perfect example. Look, the story of Cain and Abel, the story of Adam and Eve, the story of Noah and all that other junk, it was all no different than the story of the frog and the scorpion. It's all the same. And it is just like the biggest joke on planet Earth that people believe that this is real and literal. Adam, ground, slash human, and dom means red. Also, it's a title. Interesting. Didn't know. Oh, God. I didn't even realize that, like, I was still in the battle. I thought I won. Okay. It said, when you till the ground, it will henceforth not yield unto thee her strength. And then, of course, even after the flood. As you till the ground, it says. As you till the, as you till the atom is what that that really says. <laughs> I kind of funny, right? I mean, Adam literally means earth. Like how do you, or ground, how do you get around this? This is insane. Like what these people believe is insane, but okay. The, the earth and the ground and farming became even more difficult because it seems like the natural vitality was diminished. So by the time Israel came on the scene, God told the people of Israel through Moses, that they were to farm the land for six years and then let it rest on the seventh year. It was like a seven-year Sabbath. It oh, yeah. There was a special thing Jews had for uh, the number seven back in the day. Uh, to my knowledge, it's kind of maintained today. Number uh, On the seventh day, you're supposed to rest. On the seventh year, you forgive certain debts. And on the... 50th year or the 49th depending on who you're talking to or or what like what denomination of judaism it is or whatever on the 49th or 50th year it's like it's called a jubilee year you're supposed to treat it as something special so on and so forth and give it a chance to kind of regain its nutrition and you would basically leave it fallow and it would sort of heal itself and develop more vitality and the organic material would build up the soil you know i i know about the uh, end of the 19th century, uh, George Washington Carver became famous because he showed a lot of the plantation growers that they were just, they weren't able to produce the cotton anymore because cotton took so much nitrogen out of the soil. Dude, what the hell is this guy talking about? The, the, is he talking about the peanut butter guy taught 
plantation workers, a.k.a. slaves, taught slaves that they shouldn't be growing cotton or something? Like, what? What is all this? They're not plantation workers, by the by. You shouldn't be calling them plantation workers. They were slaves, but okay. He said, you got to plant other things like sweet potatoes and peanuts. And they said, what are we going to do with peanuts? He said, I'll think of something. <laughs> He thought of a lot of things. Okay, I, I don't, that doesn't sound right. The, the dude did not invent peanut butter. Peanut butter existed before. He just came up with a whole bunch of really unique, interesting ways to use peanut butter is all. But okay, I, like none of this sounds right at all. Like literally every word out of this dude's mouth sounds fabricated. But whatever, whatever things to do with peanuts, including asphalt. He had all kinds of things he invented. But the whole idea was those were crops that would put nitrogen back into the soil and build it up. God knew the ground needed to rest so that it could recover and retain its vitality. Well, for a little while, the Jews followed that law, but as near as we can tell studying Bible history, it was largely forgotten. He told them the seventh year, you shall let it rest in life fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. Uh, is it actually good to not farm land on the seventh year? Is that true, or is he just, like, making this up again? Is he just fabricating this right off the top of his head, as usual? I can't, I, I, I can't tell. I don't know. I don't trust a word out of the dude's mouth. Sorry, I need some lip chap. Some lip chap, as my friends across the pond would, would say. Lip chap. And by friends across the pond, I mean people in New Zealand, not those piece of shit English, Britain, UK people. Just kidding. I like you guys, too. You're all my friends. This lip chap is not coming out. Come on, lip chap. I need you. There we are. Got lip chap. Okay, let's keep listening. Whatever came up volunteer, the poor were allowed to glean. But they kept harvesting year after year, and they neglected to let the land rest. So God said, look, if you're not going to let the land rest, I will make you let the land rest. Finally, after 490 years of disobedience, they were carried off to Babylon. Bible. Mm, okay, he's talking about the exilic period where... Uh, from the year 1000, roughly, da King David... There's very little evidence that, that King David was a real person. Very little extra-biblical evidence. But there's some. There's some. Um, as far as anybody can tell, really the only evidence that David was a real actual person was something like um, they found like a, like a stone that said the house of David on it or something. to I don't even remember now. Anyway. Um, there's some evidence that David was a real person. But around the year 1000, give or take, David was the king, and he united the entire area, and he married a whole bunch of wives as part of the deal of uniting the area. Now he controls the entire Levant. And you know what that means? It means he controls the trade that comes in and out of that area. Any trade that goes between Africa and Asia, he gets a cut of it. That's what that means, that it's united. And he left the kingdom to who is revered today, but in my, in my opinion, is his dumbass son, Solomon, King Solomon. Everybody says wise King Solomon. Seems dumb as dog shit to me. I've lived for the Lord my whole life. And I was dumb as a box of rocks and didn't know it. I'm dumber than a box of rocks in a lot of areas. I mean, these people, you know, wise King Solomon. Oh, let's cut a baby in half. I'm so wise. Anyway, uh, I, I, there's literally nothing that I know of that King Solomon did that was wise. You know what King Solomon did? He fractured the, the country, the united country that David left him with into a billion pieces and didn't control any of it. And it was his fault because Solomon was given an opportunity to work with these people. And he was like, nah, I don't want to work with them. I, I want to be a dickhead. 
I want to be an asshole, so that's what I'm going to do. And he was heavy-handed, as described in the Bible. He was heavy-handed, and he lost his kingdom. He lost the ability to retain the Levant area. King Solomon was a fool. He was not wise. He was an idiot. I'm sorry. That's just what it is. David, I think he was w wise as they come, but he, he was kind of a scumbag, in my opinion, just based on the biblical narrative. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. You know what? I got to find Chadley, and I got to do my, um, yeah, I got to find Chadley, and I got to do my extra stuff here. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, the year 1000, David controlled the Levant area, the whole Levant area. And then he left it to King Solomon. King Solomon has um, the temple, Solomon's temple built. And Solomon's temple stood for like 450 years or something. I think Solomon controlled the area or controlled like Israel or Judea or something or other for like 450 years until the, the year like 601 BCE or something like that when the Babylonian empire when Nebuchadnezzar came into power and he swept through the area he had troops he was very very powerful and he said to all of the provinces around I will let you continue to control your own provinces if you pay me tribute and Israel paid tribute for four years either Israel or Judea it might have been Judea anyway Wow, it, that was weird. It just flipped over. Anyway, so they paid for four years, and then they said, go heck yourself, I'm done. And so Nebuchadnezzar swept in, and he was like, okay, if you say so. And he just, like, destroyed everything. He took down Jerusalem, and he took, he took the government captive, made a mess of everything in the early days. Uh, this is around the year... This is in the late 500s BCE. And um, they continued paying tribute. Uh, they formed another government afterward, and they continued paying tribute. And then they stopped paying tribute again, and Nebuchadnezzar swept in and took the entire government and about... I mean, the, the Bible says it was the entire... Jewish population into exile, into slavery in Babylon. That's not true. It's about 20%. The other 80% or so stayed in Samaria, what used to be Israel, and they stayed in Judea, and they lived in little communes, provinces, and stuff. So anyway, 586 BCE was, it was uh, Nebuchadnezzar's second pass. Again, covered in my book. Talked about all of it. It was his second pass, 586 BCE. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that it was uh, 606 BCE incorrectly, but that's necessary for their end times beliefs to be correct. And so 586 BCE, he sweeps through. He destroys Solomon's temple. 538 or maybe 536 is one of the two. I don't remember which. One of them was what... Jehovah's Witnesses believed incorrectly, and the other is the correct answer. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember which one's a correct answer now. I'd, I'd have to check my book. But anyway, um, 538 or 536, the Persian Empire rises up, and they take control of the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonians stood for a long time until Persians came along. Persians come in and free the Jews, let them go back to Babylon if they want. And they ordered the temple be rebuilt. And I think between 516 and 514 BCE, it was rebuilt, um, Solomon's temple. And when it was rebuilt, it wasn't Solomon's temple. It's now called the Second Temple. It was once again destroyed in the year 70. CE, about 35 or so years after Jesus died, it was destroyed uh, under King Herod, I think. 
And um, time goes on, middle, middle, middle. The Muslims take over the area and they build a monument called the Dome of the Rock on top of it or in that area. And they build the Al-Aqsa Mosque right where the on the Temple Mount, they built the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And um, so a third temple cannot be built unless the Al-Aqsa Mosque is destroyed. And if the Al-Aqsa Mosque is destroyed, it will be World War III, straight up. Every Muslim, all 1.1 billion Muslims are going to come against every Jew and probably every Christian at that point. It's going to be insane. And I think that's what Israel is working toward right now because that's part of the belief, you know, the Israeli government believes that, like, a third temple must exist, and if it doesn't, then the end will never come, so on and so forth. Anyway, sorry, just want to give a little bit of background on some of the stuff he's talking about. He, he probably doesn't know any of this stuff, what I just explained. It tells us that they burnt the house of God. This is the Babylonians burnt the temple of God in Jerusalem. They yeah. That's correct, yeah. So the Babylonians came in and they destroyed the city. And uh, the house of God, I guess, it, does he mean Solomon's temple when he says the house of God? I, I'm assuming so. That was in 586. Okay, go on. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned... Okay, they broke the, the wall down at a different time. They broke the wall down like 20 or 30 years earlier no 20 years earlier or something like that i don't remember so i'm not like he's kind of mixing events together here burnt all the palaces thereof with fire notice this is second chronicles 36 19 a very important verse and then that escaped the sword he carried away to babylon now don't miss this important point the people that were in jerusalem that didn't escape the city they were destroyed and that city was burnt with fire those who were spared and shown mercy were taken off to Babylon to that golden city. Remember we studied Babylon was like the golden city. Yeah, the, again, the Old Testament claims that all of the Jews were taken to Babylon to be slaves. That's probably because the writer who was describing the time period and, and the, what was going on in, in that moment was taken and assumed that everybody was taken. It was only like 20% of the Jews were taken. And they were able to then come back after the time in Babylon, which was 70 years. It says, until the land... Okay, hold on now. It what, they did not spend 70 years in Babylon. Let's really break this down. 586 BCE is when the Babylonians captured the Jews and destroyed the temple and, and, and everything. And it was final. 586 BCE, right? They were freed in 536 uh, BCE. So it's 50 years, not 70 years. But it has to be 70 years and because it's relevant to end times prophecy, to eschatology. Not for Jehovah's Witnesses, or not just for Jehovah's Witnesses, but apparently for these guys too. Like they're completely wrong on the facts, on all of this stuff. This drives me insane. In Babylon, which was 70 years. It says, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. This is the part I wanted to underscore. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years, or we would say 70 years. So while... Okay, I don't know what he's talking about, but whatever. The land around Jerusalem was desolate, Nobody was in the land. It tells us that it was keeping Sabbath. You can read Nehemiah 1, that during that time it says, the walls of Jerusalem also are broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. Now, when we go to Revelation and we start reading about this 1,000 years in Revelation, keep in mind that the Bible says a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years. Oh, no, dude. He's going to do the, uh, oh, my God. Is this guy going to go with the day-year principle? Is that what he's doing right now? He's about to do? Day-year principle is like this old, long-debunked belief from, like, the 1800s that 
anytime there's a year listed in the Bible, it can be switched out with a day or vice versa. Anytime a day is mentioned, it can be changed out with a year. And that is actually how Jehovah's Witnesses like arrive at a lot of their conclusions, the day year principle. And it is like that's one of their verses. Oh, that's super interesting. Okay, go on. And years are like a day. And we know that God works on a principle through the Bible of six days you work and one day you rest. There's going to be a thousand year period of time when the planet rests and recovers from the curse of sin. And it is going to be desolate during that time. And so you stay with me, friends, and I think you're going to see how this all fits together and makes perfect sense as we go through it. And I'm going to give you... I mean, it's already not making any sense. He says it's going to make perfect sense when we go through it. No, I, for some reason, don't believe him. <laughs> A lot of scripture. It'll be in your lesson. I hope you're using the lessons. You can download them for free. If not, take some notes. And you can look these things up. Yeah, it's going to be a hard pass for me. Thank you so much for the offer. All right, so we've got question and answer to study the subject of the millennium. Question number one, what events mark the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time? I'm assuming when he says the 1,000-year period of time, what he means is the end of the tribulation. Does he think that we're in, like, the period of time like right immediately before armageddon right now or like does he think that the antichrist is on scene because that's kind of like one of the uh prerequisites to the thousand years taking place or whatever right well you go to first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and there the apostle paul tells us for the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ rise first. So the Lord is coming down. Okay, did he, wait, was, did he read the, he did, he read the Thessalonians verse. Okay, give some context to this one. Uh, the, Thessalonians is the earliest piece of Christian literature that we have, uh, fascinatingly. And what was happening right now, in, in, at this point in history when Thessalonians was written, this was a letter to the congregation of Thessalonica or Thessalonica or something to that effect. Jesus wasn't supposed to die. Jesus didn't expect to die. And his apostles certainly did not expect him to die. They didn't understand what happened. To be the son of man, this the, you know, prophet that was mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures... He had to take political control of Israel. It made no sense that he would die without taking political control. Like what? So Jesus dies. Paul comes along, kind of takes control of the Christian church a few years after Jesus was already dead. Didn't even meet the dude. And he is trying to quell fears. People are like saying, we were supposed to get into the kingdom of, of uh, God. What happened? Are we going to get into the kingdom of God? People are dying. We're supposed to, like, not die until this happens. Did, isn't that what you guys said? We're not going to die until this happens? And um, to quell their fears, Paul said, Don't worry. Don't worry. The ones who died will come up out of their graves. They'll be the first ones to meet Jesus when he comes back to earth. That's what they were saying. He, they'll meet him in the sky and escort him back to earth. They were giving him like they were giving them the special status of escorting the Lord back. That's what that verse meant. It did not mean that there was a rapture. It didn't mean that there was this blah, 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 blah. didn't mean any of that stuff. But this guy is, of course, going to read into it because he has no idea what the history is. And he's just like making things up all willy-nilly because it sounds good to him and he thinks that he's right about it. And there the Apostle Paul tells us, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ rise first. So the Lord is coming down and uh, the dead are rising. This is obviously a climatic moment in history. This marks... Climactic? Yep the beginning of the 1,000-year period of time. We just read about this in Revelation chapter 20. 
It says they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And okay, I, don't, I don't know how he's connecting First Thessalonians where people are going to like come from, you know, the ground and meet Jesus in the air and Revelation 20 about reigning with Christ for a thousand years. I'm, I'm like super lost here. I, I have no clue what he's going on about. No, don't swallow me. Okay. That was close. Oh, my God. I can't stand it when this dude swallows me. That blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. The dead in Christ rise first. So that's the starting point for when this yep. thousand years begin. The bastard swallowed me. The other bastard. I wasn't paying any attention, and he swallowed me. It's the coming of the Lord, the resurrection, those of us who are alive and remain being transformed and caught up to meet the Lord in the air sometimes called a rapture, but it's not a secret rapture. Everyone's going to know when that happens. The rest of the dead, Revelation 20, verse... He swallowed me. He swallowed me again. I'm getting really sick of these guys swallowing me. I'm going to lose my shit in a second if they don't let me just... All right. I'm going to get my guys back. I, I Okay, I got one back. That's very frustrating that I... I, I Dude, I think he swallowed another one. What the hell is happening? God, I can't stand these dudes. Anyway, sorry. Let's, con let's continue listening. Five. No, oh, wait. If the dead in Christ rise first, who are the rest of the dead? The wicked. You've only got two choices. Once you've taken the good out of the equation, you've only got the bad. There's only two categories. Jesus said you're either with me or against me. Uh, really, the verse meant anyone who had died since Jesus came back. Everybody else is included in, you know, they'll be led into the kingdom of God if they're good people. If they're one of the sheep and not one of the goats. Which means if you, if you take care of the poor, if you feed the hungry, if you give water to the thirsty, if you house the homeless, you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. That was a prerequisite to being like one of God's people, to making it into the kingdom of God. You had to be a good person who took care of people. But let's just, you know, let's forget that. Forget that. It's all about gathering money from your patrons, from your congregation, so you can buy bigger jets and fly around, you know, the world and, and stuff, of course. Okay. You're saved or loss. There are two roads in life. You're on the straight road on the way to heaven, that straight gate, or you're on the broad, and they call it Broadway, you're on the broad road to destruction. So the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are finished, which, what does that imply? After the thousand years are finished, they do live, right? It says, uh, okay, I feel like he's, uh, okay, well, maybe so. I'm, uh, maybe he's not extrapolating. Um, I feel like all these people do a lot of extrapolating in this whole thing, but okay. This is the first resurrection, meaning those who are raised, the first resurrection when Jesus comes. What else will happen at the first resurrection? First Corinthians. Wait, so this guy believes in a resurrection uh, like Jehovah's Witnesses. That's fascinating. In 15, verse 51 and 52, we will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. You know, I used to wonder what that word incorruptible meant. It means we then have these glorified bodies that do not get old and decay and corrupt, but we've got Im immortal, eternal, vigorous bodies, and we're transformed. And it, it doesn't happen slowly like a butterfly. It happens instantaneously, and the Lord can do that. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The Bible tells us flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, meaning... That's really interesting. Jehovah's Witnesses take this whole subset or whatever of the Bible to mean immortality and everlasting life are different. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe about it. And their reasoning is immortals are incorruptible. They cannot be corrupted. It's impossible. They're like angels, they're immortal. Can't be killed because they can't be corrupted. They, they are good forever. But 
somebody who has everlasting life, on the other hand, they can be corrupted. And if they are corrupted, like, say, you know, if they turn gay or something like that, they will be killed by God. Even having everlasting life, they'll still, you know, God can still take them out. He can still kill them. That's the idea. That's the way that, like, Jehovah's Witnesses view it. I don't know if that's accurate to how this guy views it or what. I don't know. But, yeah, that's Jehovah's Witnesses view. I think it's interesting. Our regular flesh and blood bodies, they get old. That's not the body that inherits eternal life. But more about that to come. Who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So if we're wondering what kind of bodies do we have, We've got bodies like the body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. Now, he had a glorified body that was, let me back up and say this differently. God made Adam and Eve with real bodies. They were meant to live forever. But they ate and they worked and they were able to uh, rest, not because they were exhausted, but it was a, it's a pleasant rest. And they're real physical bodies. God is going to accomplish his original plan. Okay, again, Adam, Adam means soil, ground, earth. It was a campfire story, not real. But all right, all right, not going to poke holes. I'm just going to continue on. Go on. Plus an upgrade. But when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that fourth dimension that we will call the spiritual side of their nature. See, right now, wherever you are and here in the studio, there are angels here. Probably good. I'm sorry? Good and bad. There's angels all around. Uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And uh, Dude, I get so sick of hearing that saying. I hear it constantly from, like, Kenneth Copeland, nonstop. My God, dude. Rulers in heavenly places. And so uh, there's a spiritual realm that we don't see. If our eyes could have the veil removed, like the servant of Elisha, we would see the hills are surrounded with chariots of fire. But when man sinned, that sense, that spiritual sense was destroyed or damaged. We're going to have bodies that will be physical and spiritual, but these are glorified immortal bodies that have powers and abilities that we just don't have now. But they're real. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ate, he said, touch me, see that Flesh and blood doesn't, uh, ha uh, that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see that I have now. And it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the brightness of his coming and uh, the Lord is going to burn up then the wicked and, uh, when he comes. So when Jesus comes, when the resurrection takes place, when we are transformed, we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air with glorified bodies and reunite with the saved who are the dead in Christ, at the same time, what happens to the wicked? This is at the beginning of the 1,000 years. The wicked who are alive, it says they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Dude, this is such a confusing, bizarre, whacked out, windy eschatology, like end times belief. I don't, what is he even saying right now? The one group that says, lo, this is our God, we have waited for him and he will save us. And then you got the other group, and uh, they flee from his presence, calling for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them and hide them from his face. And then the whole creation sort of implodes at that time when Christ comes. The earth is it's in bad shape. It says, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And notice what else. Every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Now, this picture of a hailstone that you see, I understand someone sent this to me yesterday, and it is from Australia, and it looks to me like it's a five-pound block of hail, and I know the gentleman, and... Um, uh, okay, what point is he getting to with this? He's showing us a big five-pound block of hail? Let me just step back a little bit. Listen again heaven now this picture of a hailstone that you see i understand okay, a l little bit further i want to listen because he's got a point here right and hide them from his face and then the whole creation sort of implodes at that time when christ comes the earth is it's in bad shape it says in so i guess this guy believes that he's going to be raptured 
when Jesus comes back and then all of creation is going to implode, right? Because this is different from a lot of other, like, religious beliefs, a lot of other religions. They think that they are, as Christians, going to have to live on Earth through, you know, this seven-year period of time where the Antichrist is going to control this and that, and it's going to be ugly, and everybody's going to be suffering, and middle, middle, middle. Finally, after the seven-year period, whoever doesn't fall for the, you know, the Antichrist nonsense... They're going to be saved at the end of it. Armageddon comes, and they're the ones that are going to make it through Armageddon. And, of course, the ones that worship Trump like the second coming of Jesus, they believe that they're the ones that are going to make it through Armageddon. So, okay. There was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And notice what else. Every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Now, this picture of a hailstone that you see, I understand someone sent this to me. Oh, okay. So it says that, like, great hail will fall out of heaven. Okay. So somebody found a gigantic hailstone. And I guess that's a sign that the end is here? Yesterday. And it is from Australia. And it looks to me like it's a five-pound block of hail. And I know the gentleman, and uh, that's one example. There's some big hailstorms. I, I heard that the... So the end is like here. It'll be here any five minutes now. Is that what he's trying to tell us? Hail on record was softball sized, but that looks softball sized to me there. And it was in Pakistan, and it killed people. You read about the hail, one of the plagues of Egypt. It killed man and beast that were out in the field. But this hail that's coming... It says, every hailstone is the weight of a talent. That would be approximately 75 pounds by today's measurement. So you got the earth quaking, mountains are being swallowed up, the dead in Christ are rising, those who are alive are being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the wicked are fleeing from his presence, trying to hide in the surface of the broken earth. Being like, you know, the problem with this whole thing is that he was wrong from the beginning. The first verse that he read, he read incorrectly. Like, it is all incorrect. It's, he doesn't seem to understand, like, any of this stuff or the origins of it or what it meant or how it was written or anything. It, 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 like, he just doesn't get it. He just doesn't understand, like, any of it. This dude literally, seemingly, spent his life reading... The like the uh, you know reading the Bible wrong, like not understanding what the hell it's even saying, coming to the conclusion that it's talking about like the earth being destroyed and great hail will blah, 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 blah. like what? My God, bro! Just look at a little bit of history, a little bit of history. That's all I'm asking. All you gotta do is look at some history. Look at the um, scientific consensus of other evangelical nutcases, and they will tell you that you're completely full of shit. It's insane that he holds any of these positions, but okay, okay, whatever. Anyway, tell me what you think about that in the comments. This dude is embarrassing and ridiculous and entertaining as hell. Uh, I may be watching this tomorrow. I might also be watching Flashpoint, a TV show on Kenneth Copeland's uh, TV network. Uh, tomorrow morning, I watch it Wednesday and Thursday mornings, 1030 to 230. So if you want to come over and watch it with me, then come over. Owen Moore, or It's Owen Unfiltered YouTube channel. Link in the description, okay? All right, I'm going to get off here.